going on guys welcome back to another episode of the games adjusters top 40 games of all time today we're talking about the top 30 through 21 this is the second episode in the series if you've not seen it already check out the top 40 through 31 that video was a little bit longer than this one's going to be hopefully there was a little preamble to introduce what the list was going to be about uh, and the reasoning behind top 40 as opposed to the traditional top 50 or top 100 so um, again, check that out if you haven't checked it out yet, yet. If you've already seen that one, then buckle up for another top uh, 10 list here until we get to the top 10 through 1. And so um, here we go. I'm going to go ahead and just jump right into it, starting with my number 30. So number 30 is a bigger game, almost a 3X style game. This is Empires of the Void 2, and this is published by Red Raven Games. So. Um, this is my first introduction to Ryan Lockett's games. I had not played one of his before, and it's a very beautiful game. And so if you've seen my review of Near and Far, uh, if you haven't, checked it out. But if you've seen it, I've talked about uh, Ryan Lockett, the wonderkin of board games. He publishes his own game, designs the games, does the art for the game. He's amazing, just a super talented person. And, you know, you can see just in this cover how beautiful his art is. And when you actually play the game, I'll show you the back here. It's even more so. I mean, you've got these beautiful planets that just sit on the space board and they're uh, modular so you can change the layout of where they go. Um, but they're just, they just pop. They're just so awesome to look at. And, and beyond just the production that I'm you know, glowing about, it's also the gameplay. You've got a very simple mechanism of, of using this command uh, token to select which action you're going to take. Other people can follow that action by spending some command points that they have. And you were just trying to rule the galaxy, basically. You're exploring the galaxy, trying to either take over different races um, that are in the different planets or become friends with them and ally with them and get some of their special powers or start recruiting some of their units to join you and your empire as you try to strive for the most points at the end. And that's the end game here. It's not um, like a TI-4 where you're going for like a 14-point or 10-point game. It's more points than that, um, and you're just trying to get most points by accomplishing the different goals that you can get, um, taking care of the planets, like I said, or allying with them, uh, and as well as some of the stories that you get. So this isn't quite the same as like the storybook games like a Near and Far or, or like a Sleeping Gods that he's done, but it's got that same element to it in that you've got these different planets like we talked about, but they each have a story that you can shuffle into the deck. And so when that card comes up, there's a certain event happening at this planet. I think there's five for each one, and there's like eight to ten planets. So the way the game plays out every time is going to be slightly different based on what stories might come up. You might have this parasitic uh, you know, species that's just taking over the galaxy that you'll have to contend with. You might have to uh, make a you know, jailbreak for someone or, or take you know, resources from one place to another to get different items. So... It's just a very cool, very well done game, very elegant game. Um, I just really enjoy it. And it's, again, it's a pleasure to look at too. So that certainly helps. So I really enjoy it. That's uh, Empires of the Void 2, published by Red Raven Games. Uh, 3X space game that you should definitely check out. All right. Moving right along into my number 29. And so this is a much lighter game but nonetheless still very good and that is reef and so reef is published by plan b games i believe it's designed by emerson matsuchi and so in reef you this is the first edition by the way so it's not as color friendly i think that's the reason they changed it but it's got the basic uh purple green yellow and red uh coral pieces basically and so it's um in the last list i kind of talked about this simple engine building type feeling and that's almost what this is it's not necessarily an engine uh, like in century that i was talking about but in this game you've got a hand of cards you can only have about four of them i think and you are building on your board these different uh, shapes of the reef and you can stack them up up to four high you can place them in different variations and so you're trying to score the cards from a top down view and so the cards will have different requirements like maybe making an l shape with the purple coral or having certain stacks of four high with a certain color on top or maybe even you know doesn't matter what color is on top looking down it's just that they all have to be too high and you get certain points for that so 
constantly reevaluating um, what you need to score and when you need to score it as, as new opportunities come up. And that's the cool part about it is when you play a card, you not only add from your hand, uh, I'm sorry, from the pool, like you'll see here, it's kind of hard to see, I'm sure, but you're not only adding coral pieces to your board, but the bottom of it is how you can score right in that moment. So sometimes you'll play a card just for the pieces so that you can really score a good one later. But to win the game, you really have to maximize both. Not only do you want to be adding coral pieces to your reef, but you want to be scoring every time you do, even if it's just a couple of points. So that way, no turn is wasted. You're always getting points. And so this is a game I really enjoy. Um, you know, I like to think I'm pretty good at it. I don't think I've ever lost it. Um, and not that you have to win games to be to enjoy them, but it, it certainly helps, right? So um, this one is just a very cool efficiency puzzle. Again, where you're constantly reevaluating. You might get ready to score that card, and someone flips a new one over. You're like, hmm. Well, if I grab that one now, I can play it first and score this one, and then I'll play this card, and then I'll score that one I was going to score. So, again, really enjoy it. That is Reef by Plan B Games. Uh, this has pretty much replaced Azul for me. So, quick mention there. If you're an Azul fan, I think you might enjoy this one more just because of the way uh, the theme also, and also it's just an awesome different variations of scoring. So, check it out. All right. Uh, so, number three. Uh, 28 I actually do not own uh, and this is a heavier euro worker placement card action selection type game called underwater cities and so underwater cities by delicious games I think that's Vladimir Suchi um, it's a, a kind of everybody kind of compares it to Terry Ford and Mars which is not completely accurate I think they're different enough but it's got that same feeling of kind of building this um, civilization in a land that's normally not um, been inhabited. So in Terraforming Mars, of course, you're on Mars. And you're trying to make it suitable for, for human living. In underwater cities, you've gotten a situation where you're now having to take human life and build it underwater and formulate or create these cities with desalination plants and um, you know algae producing plants and things of that nature so you can make it you know inhabit or make it inhabitable and things like that so um it's a very cool board where you basically have like workers that are just they don't look like traditional workers they're just like little plaques uh, but you will place these out along with the cards to take the action if the card matches the action color that you're taking it's orange green and red then you can do the card too and if not you just have to discard a card every time you take the action so um, it's a very cool puzzle of, you know, connecting the action with the card, trying to maximize both so that you can make sure that you're getting a full turn out of it and not having a situation where you're just taking the action, not getting anything for the card. Um, or, you know, it's, it's what's that. And it's also kind of tense in that people can take the spot you really need. And so turn order becomes very important in that game. Um, you know, trying to build this little engine on the side too, where you've got this tableau of cards that you can take actions with once per round and, you know, do things to help, you know, maybe, uh, maybe substitute for something that you needed to do on the normal place that someone else took. So it's a very cool game. It's, it's a, kind of a longer game. Otherwise I think it'd be higher on my list. But it's still very fun. It's a very thinky game, not like the, the games you've seen so far. And, and I will mention as we go on, things might get a little heavier um, and maybe a little more interaction too, which is kind of a preview. But uh, yeah, it's a, just a very cool Euro game. Very much enjoy it. And if you like Terraforming Mars, but you don't like the randomness that comes with a huge stack of cards, uh, this has cards, but there's not quite as big a stack. And it's definitely something you can check out. Uh, and there's an expansion too that will add the recess player boards it's almost like terraforming mars 2 got a problem where you can jostle and things move around like the first edition of terraform mars so uh they fixed that with the expansion as well as adding new cards so it's it's pretty easy to throw in and, and you should check it out if you do like it so that is my number 30 i'm sorry 28 underwater cities by delicious games so 27 i do have and this is one of many dudes on a map games you will see going forward so this one is The Others, and this is published by Come On. And so The Others, it's a little bit older, older of a game now. Big Kickstarter production. 
Uh, it's, it's got the seven deadly sins theme, and it's you know beautifully done, as beautiful as a horror theme can be. Uh, you've got all of these awesome minis uh, in this box, a base game. You've got Pride and Sloth. Uh, you've got um, the minis that represent these sins, and then you've got other minis uh, that are kind of like minions that also represent this in, in a lesser form and so they're they're kind of grotesque if you really look at it it's definitely a not a family game just because some of the minis can be a little um rated r you know but i'm an adult so i i can thoroughly enjoy it and it's just something that i really enjoy is this one versus all that's what makes it awesome too is it's a one versus all game i don't have many of those in my collection and it's pretty tough you know it's it's a game where i think the win rate probably is 60 40 the sin player and you could scale that if the sin player wants to take it a little easier on the players maybe make it a little you know 50 50 more but um you know it's a game where you've got to cooperate you've got to think about okay if i take my character and i go take care of this baddie real quick you can go and run and, and use the city action and you can take this you know satellite basically that'll shoot down this area and take care of one of their bigger baddies and then we can you know start accomplishing these goals and the, the way this game is so modular is probably what impresses me the most is you've got you know the base game the two sins and it is a kind of expensive game i've got everything's so all the sins there's five more apocalypse expansion and different teams but it's not a situation where you have all this stuff because you're completionist and you're never going to use it. You can easily work in the different teams, the different sins, the different maps seamlessly because you've got a storybook that's only got, or I'm sorry, you have uh, this, these story cards that have different layouts of maps for the same story. So that's variable there. And then all you need to do is pick a sin, pick your team, which has to have a certain amount of colored um, characters like you know a certain amount of red yellow blue and green and then pick your story and that's it you throw it all together put it on the board and you're ready to play and just changing one of those elements can drastically change the way you need to play the game you could have all the same characters the same story a different sin and now you need to reprioritize how you proceed through that story and not only that the story itself has diverging paths so same thing you can play the same mission same everything the same except choose the left path instead of the right path um, and so in that is just an awesome game uh, very just a dice chucker of a game with exploding dice who doesn't love that you know just that one chance maybe you'll win and you get an exploding dice and you keep rolling you keep rolling and then soon enough you take them out so definitely worth checking out uh, if you can get all this stuff and you're you know into those big kickstarter productions this is one you should check out for sure um, but I will warn you, it's a little expensive, maybe kind of hard to track down. So that's my number 37, I'm sorry, 27. And that is The Others. Okay. So 26 is going to be, is that right? 20, yeah, 26 is going to be a weird combination of a game. And that is... Australia and so Australia is designed by Martin Wallace brought to America by I believe by Stronghold Games and this is kind of a weird combination of, of themes it's got Cthulhu with baddies and old ones and things that you're trying to take out but it's also got Martin Wallace train building like steam and so it's it's kind of a weird combination but somehow it just works and that's why I love it so much it's you know this time track basically and I, I love that time track mechanism too where you can keep taking actions until you're not the last player anymore and then the last player goes and depending on you know how uh, difficult the action is the more time it takes and so you're, you're constantly taking these actions one by one you know until you're not you know up anymore and the next person goes and eventually all the players will get to a point where they pass the old ones and once they pass the old ones now the old one starts taking turns and these tiles start flipping over and now zombies and um, what are they called? Shoggoths maybe. Uh, they start moving toward you and impeding what you're trying to do. So you're still trying to do, you know, Euro-E trainee type things. You're trying to build farms. You're trying to build track. You're trying to get phosphate out and resources from 
the board, but you're also trying to build your army out and, and take out these old ones. And sometimes you don't know what the old one's going to be. It's flipped over and you go to interact with it and it's just a harmless kangaroo. And so there's suspense in what's behind those tiles as you set them up. There's suspense in, you know, where are they going to go? When you combat is really awesome, it's it's basically a card flip where you kind of, you know, bring the resources you want to bring, you know, infantry, armored trains, um, airships, things like that. You flip a card and the card will tell you, did that particular unit hit? And if you do, great. Uh, sometimes, depending on the unit you're fighting, they might hit you back. Sometimes you might get a sanity. And if you get too many sanity, you'll lose the fight. So it's kind of this push your luck almost where you're like, well, I've already got two sanity. If I get a third one, I'm out, but I want to keep going. So here we go. I'm going to flip it and see what happens. So uh, it's a really weird combination of, of mechanisms that just works. And so I really enjoy it. It's, if you think that sounds cool, you should check it out. If you like Cthulhu, if you like trains, you have to check it out. It's a perfect marriage. Uh, and it is on Kickstarter now too. And I, I've, I've backed that. So I'm very excited for the new Tasmania and um, this Revenge of the Old Ones expansion that's going to make it a one versus all, just kind of like the others. So I'm very excited for that. Tasmania will add another map too and a, a modular map. That's going to be really cool too. You can kind of change the layout. So yeah, I really enjoy Australia. It's also got awesome artwork too. They do a really good job with this production. So uh, like I said, if you like trains, if you like Cthulhu, either one of them, even if you like both of them exclusively, it's still worth checking out. And if you, again, if you like both of them at the same time, then you really need to check it out. So that is Australia by Stronghold Games. Okay, um, moving on now. We are in the 25, and 25 is the first Kickstarter I ever backed, and that is Smartphone Inc. And so this is another Arcane Wonders Dice Tower Essential game. I had first played this when it was still just Cosmodrome games before Arcane Wonders brought it or, you know, got involved with the Dice Tower Essentials line. And I had played this at PAX South. And it was my first convention uh, pre-COVID that I had ever gone to. And I really enjoyed it. I'd never been to a, a board game convention. And even now it's kind of a combination of board games and video games. Um, but, you know, just kind of opened my eyes to like all the different games and things that you can do in a convention and seeing this awesome library. And this was on the hot games table. I was kind of, you know, scouting it for the longest time towards the end of the day. We finally got to play it. And I'm so glad I did. I loved it. it I love economic games. And it's a simple economic game at that. It's got these very unique um, tablet kind of things, boards that you will place over each other to take the actions. So depending on what icons you reveal and what icons you cover will dictate what actions you can take. And then once everybody's planned those boards, they will just execute the actions in order and there's only like five rounds. So you'll start by revealing your board, uh, you'll do technologies, you'll do production, you'll start expanding, uh, then you'll just sell your phones. And when you sell these smartphones, they're just little cubes, but you will place them on different areas and get money based on the price that you set at the beginning of the round. And so it can be cutthroat in that you might undercut somebody by really reducing your price, getting to go first because they'll lower the price the sooner you can go, and then sell to all the, the buyers that work to buy, you know, not only your phones, but your neighbor's phone maybe. And so now they have no one to sell to because each buyer has a certain price that they're willing to pay and certain technologies that they're willing to pay for regardless of price. And so if you have met those needs, they no longer need, you know, your opponent's phone. They've already bought yours. And so there's this constant battle of, I want to take more actions. I want to do more technology, but maybe I need to reduce my price so that I can go first because I can have all this cool technology and that does get you points. But if you don't sell your phones, you're not going to get as many points because at the end of the day, the most money, plus those points you get from the technology is going to be the winner. Uh, and then this is the Kickstarter version, like I said, and so I do have the uh, 2.1 status update included. It also came with some directives, which give you some alternative ways of getting points. Uh, it also comes with a smaller board for two to three players, which is very awesome because I do play sometimes with just my wife and my daughter, and it's perfect for us because that bigger board is too big for a two or three player game, and the tighter board is perfect. So. Uh, if you are looking for 
an economic game that is awesome to look at. I know it's just kind of white, but it's stark and it's got good components. It's got these um, trays that hold all the cubes and move them around appropriately. So really cool, really unique mechanism of using those fours to pick your actions. And if that sounds interesting to you, you should check it out. So that is Smartphone Inc. by Cosmodrome Games and Arcane Wonders, my number 25. All right, so number 24 really could be, you know, pick your flavor. I'm choosing Legendary James Bond. So Legendary James Bond is a regular legendary deck building game, not an encounters game. Um, but it's very much in the vein of Legendary Marvel, Legendary Buffy. Uh, no Legendary Counters to get slightly different with the Firefly and the Aliens, Predator, etc. But this one is my flavor of choice strictly because of IP. I'm a huge James Bond fan. I know that they're not always the, the best movies. I know they're kind of corny with the guy always getting the girl and the girl having uh, some you know provocative name. I, I get it. But somehow, for some reason, I just love it. So I love James Bond. I love the spy theme. I love the mastermind villain. And this, this game just brings it out. So you are playing through a Bond movie. And the first game has four movies from four different eras. So you can play as Pierce Brosnan in GoldenEye. You can play as Daniel Craig in Casino Royale. You can play as Roger Moore. Uh, and then you can play as the original, um, you know, Sean Connery. And so it's got these movies that you, you're using characters from. It's got stills from them. So if you're not a fan of that, you maybe not like it. It doesn't bother me. It just kind of makes me, me more to the theme or reminds me of watching the movie and makes me want to watch it again. So I really enjoy it. And, and that's just the IP overlay. The game itself is just legendary. And so what you're doing is starting with a hand of cards. Uh, some cards will do damage, some cards will help you buy more cards. And so you just deck build your, your hand and try to get the best little deck building engine you can to defeat the villains, defeat the henchmen, ultimately take out the mastermind, and also prevent yourself from losing a mission fail uh, condition where if you don't use your spending money to, instead of purchasing things, completing missions, you might go up this track, and if you breach a certain threshold, you'll lose. So it's a great cooperative game that can be played competitively where you count points, but we don't really do that. Uh, the game's hard enough just to win, really. So if you like Legendary, you don't have to get James Bond. You can get Marvel or some other thing you like. But if you are wondering, does the James Bond Legendary do it justice, or is it just you know a slapped-on theme? I really think it does. If you like James Bond... You have to check this out. It's very awesome, and it's very cool. Look at here's uh, you know, the Dame Judy Dench uh, M right there, and yeah, it's just a blast from the past. I've also got the expansion in here, which is uh, brings in Timothy Dalton and three more movies. And so, again, if you like the movies, that's like I don't know if there's any other James Bond games, but if there's not, if this had to be the only one, it's a good one for that IP. All right, so. Number 23 is going to be another IP game. And after this, there will be another one. Spoiler. This one a little off the beaten path, but I'm going to shout from the rooftops about it. And that is The Legend of Korra Pro Bending Arena. And so, and I just noticed I have this backwards. Um, the Legend of Korra is a two-player only game uh, where you are playing as a team of benders or even a solo bender against another team of benders in the pro bending sport. And so uh, if you've seen Avatar, it's an amazing uh, cartoon anime hybrid that came out many, many years ago, like 2006 or so. Uh, and it's still just awesome story, amazing show that you just need to check out. Legend of Korra was a spinoff to that um, where the protagonist now is Korra, the next Avatar. And in that show, it's got this pro bending arena sport that everybody watches. And so Korra finds herself along with these other two com you know, companions that she meets participating in this sport. And so in the game, in the, in the show, they show these different teams briefly. But in this game here, they really bring them to life and they give 
if you have the deluxe version, which I do, and if you're if you're looking at this list as a recommendation list, take that with a caveat. The base game only comes with two teams, Wolf Bats and Fire Ferrets. The deluxe version comes with like six teams and solo vendors. That's the one you want. But uh, Legend of Korra is just so true to the IP. The game itself feels like pro bending. You've got your fire benders, your water benders, your earth benders doing what they do. The earth benders are, are kind of slower because they have to be grounded. The fire benders are a little more agile. The water benders have this spread ability with the water token that they place out. Um, the production is like hit and miss because the minis are awesome, but the tokens uh, kind of a misfire in the colors that they are. But if you like The Legend of Korra, you have to get this. It's The Legend of Korra in a box as far as the pro bending goes. Plus, they have characters not just in the pro bending arena, but also uh, players that are just throughout the story. And it, it kind of breaks the theme a little bit, but it's still cool to play with. You've got Pali from the Red Lotus, Unalak from um, the Water Tribe, I think the second season where she's going through, um, you know, the journey through with Rava and everything like that. So, yeah, it's just a really good two-player, almost abstracty, combat-y arena game um, that just plays like you think a pro-bending avatar-themed game should play. So, again, it's probably, if you're not into the theme, not going to be very high on your list. It's not doing anything that's that innovative. But if you like the Avatar theme, if you like Legend of Korra, you have to get this. It does it very well. The production is pretty good with these minis. I'll actually, I painted just a few of them. So I could probably show some here. Yeah, it's kind of hard to see, but I painted a few of them. And this is like the only game I painted because I love it that much. So Again, probably being a homer because of the theme, but I don't care. It's my list. So, uh, yeah, again, if you like Legend of Korra, definitely check it out. And that is my number 23. All right, two more. Number 22, I don't have, and that is going to be X-Wing, the miniatures game. Um, I did have a set, just a core set, and I played mostly with my brother-in-law, and he had a ton of X-Wing. I think he still does. Um, we haven't played it in a while, but I had to put it on my top 40 because I did love playing it when we did. X-Wing the Miniatures game is, is basically a dogfighting skirmish miniatures game where you'll build your fleet of Star, War, Star Wars um, spaceships. You've got X-Wings, TIE Fighters, TIE Bombers, Y-Wings, B-Wings, A-Wings. You name it, they've got it by now. And they just did a second edition uh, the last couple of years, and they've got them all again in, in newer versions. And... One, production-wise, it's amazing. They all come pre-painted um, with awesome artwork on the you know cards. It looks very spacey and, and very well done. These dials that are really neat as far as how you maneuver. Uh, and it, it's just a very accessible miniatures game. Instead of using, you know, line aside in the traditional sense of, you know, what can my guy see? I have to get down to the table. Instead of using tape measures and things like that, you just use these movement templates in this dial. And so in the dial, you'll indicate you know how far does this spaceship fly does it move three curve or three straight or two hard left hard right and then once you've all re you know planned that you'll just start revealing it and see what happens and if people are in range you'll start shooting and you'll just use these i think it's d8s to just see if you hit or maybe you'll get a focus token you can get more hits and you're just trying to take the other team out uh, and then you can build some absurdly huge fleets if you want to uh, just a 100-point game, you can get quite a few different ships with different power-ups and upgrades. You go up to like a 300-point game, you're talking several ships, all kinds of powers, all kinds of cool pilot abilities and with different upgrades to your, your ship. You can use, you know, Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. And I mean, there's just a ton of content. And it's something I don't have because I know the completionist in me would want too much and it, it can be very expensive. But... If you want to try it out and you're kind of looking for a miniatures game to get into and you like Star Wars, then yeah, that's definitely one you should check out because it is really well done. The painted miniatures are awesome. It's got super awesome table presence, especially if you get a like a space mat to play on. And yeah, it's just a really well done miniatures game. It's It's got a second edition for a reason. There's been some other fantasy flight games that have come out 
uh, that have not fared as well. I, I tried to get on the Rune Wars miniatures game when that first came out, and unfortunately did not do well. It's a rank and file miniatures game, but X Wing continues to do well, partly because of the IP, but also because they're pre painted, awesome miniatures, and it's an awesome game. So, again, that's my number 22 X Wing, the miniatures game. That's Fantasy Flight. And so, finally, for today's list, we've got number 21, and this is a classic, a Freedom and Freeze game, and that is Power Grid. So Power Grid, this is actually Power Grid Deluxe, which is like the second printing of it. I need to see, there's a ton of maps for the regular Power Grid. I need to know if they work for this one. But Power Grid Deluxe is the same Power Grid game, just uh, some updated artwork, updated um, components instead of using coal I think you use instead of using trash you use coal I think to power your generators but it's a very cool auction economic game at the beginning of the game you're going to start with um, auctioning for these different power plants and these power plants basically run on different resources some of them run on coal some run on gas some run on um, oil and then others run on nuclear energy and so there becomes a supply and demand puzzle that you have to figure out with your you know your opponents you have to consider you know one if i get this oil power plant let's say what is the price of oil if you know bob's in oil and sally's in oil then the price of oil depending on where i am in turn order could be very expensive because they bought all the cheap stuff maybe i need to pivot and get into the gas power plants or maybe go nuclear there's a little more expensive perhaps but no one else is doing it so i can get them while it's cheap um, or, you know, you can go with the coal that's going to be kind of cheap to start with, but you need more of it to power your plant. So there's this push and pull of supply and demand that you have to contend with with your opponents, balancing your money. You've only gotten a certain amount of money that you generate every round. You need to use that not only for the resources to power your plants, but also to expand into other territories and be able to power the most plants. Because ultimately, it's not about who has the most money. At the end of the game, it's going to be who powered the most power plants, and that's the winner. And so you're, you've got to really work on that, and you've also got to consider how much do I auction? Do I, you know, can I bid more than I can afford just to see if I can raise that price for something that Sally really wants? Um, or, you know, what if I get stuck? You know, you might try to do that to Bob, and then Bob says, all right, I'm out of the auction, and then you, you overpaid for something you didn't need, but you tried to make them pay more than what you thought they should have paid. So... Yeah, it's just a very awesome economic game. I know you use awesome a lot. I'll, I'll find some other superlatives. But yeah, it's just, you know, it's a classic at this point. And uh, Freedom and Freeze, you know these games, is green box. You guys green everything. Um, but yeah, it's a classic for a reason. This is just one that if you haven't checked it out yet. You know, you owe it to yourself to go back and check out these classics. I know we can get caught up in the cult of the new and things like that. But uh, this is one that if you haven't played it, you really need to check it out. I know it's also got the stigma of being like super mathy. And it is because you have to consider how much total money you have and how much you're willing to spend. But um, it's still a lot of fun. And it's, it's very rewarding if you come out on top because you outplayed your opponents. And there's really no luck. You know, it's the, the plants come out. Who, how do you auction which one you go for? How do you read your opponents and know what they're going to do and then be able to pivot when you need to or jump into a different um, resource pool when you have to to come out on top? And so, again, uh, definitely one you should check out. That is Power Grid, Power Grid Deluxe uh, by four Rio Grande Games. This is before we did this 2F or 4F games. So there you go. That is my 30 through 21. So uh, again, stay tuned for the next installment, which will be the 20 through 11 and the 10 through 1. If you haven't already, go back and check out the top 40 through 31. Uh, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Feel free to share your top 30 through 21 if you've got that available. Um, and we'll catch you on the next one. Take care.